The market's hot and bidding wars, well, they're back. So let's talk about five things that you can do in order to increase your chances of winning and buying your dream home. And this, it's more important than ever, as the last couple offer situations that we've been in have been 20 offers, 27 offers, 34 offers, and then what I would consider a much more reasonable 15 offer situation. Hi, I'm Jeff Chubb. I'm a recovering investment banker turned real estate agent. I've sold more than a thousand houses. If you have any real estate questions, then no, I'm here to help. The first thing to do in order to increase your chances of getting that house is setting your budget and looking at houses that are within your realistic price range. Okay, so what do I mean by this? When I started in 2008 and a buyer said that their price range was up to $500,000, for example, then we'd probably set the price band up maybe $525,000 as we knew that there was going to be some negotiation room in that price of that house. In this market, it actually works the other way. If your budget's $500,000, then you most likely don't want to take a look at that hot brand new listing price at $499,900 because it's a hot market and that house, well, it's probably just going to be bidded up. It's tough because people generally look towards the top of their price range, but a lot of the times the house that is at the top of their price range from an original asking price standpoint is actually well above the actual market price when it finally closes. It isn't crazy to see a house that's listed for $500,000 and then sell for five seventy-five dollars as an example. That's our current market. Crazy, I know. So what can you do? If you see a house that's listed for $500,000 and your budget is $500,000, then maybe just sit on the sidelines for that first weekend it's listed. Wait until after the weekend rush. If it goes beyond a week, I know this is crazy to say, but then that's game on. Another thing we've seen prospective clients be very successful with is actually looking below their price range. So if their approved price range is $500,000, then maybe they're looking at houses up to $475,000. This is really tough to do, but doing it really helps set people up to be not disappointed in the long run. One of the worst things you can do is consistently looking in houses that are over your price range. And it's because you start to want and demand the fit and finish and size of the houses that, well, are in that higher price range. But you're wanting and expecting them to be in your lower price range because you're constantly looking at them. Realistic expectations are more important than ever in this market. Now, number two, it's getting approved for your mortgage. This one is enormously important. Most people get pre-approved or even worse, pre-qualified. And then to complicate matters, the bank that you get pre-approved with, it makes a huge difference. Let's start with the bank. There are banks out there that have an awful reputation and it's well-deserved. A seller looks at the bank because they take a lot of risk when they're taking their house off the market. So it's important to mitigate that risk in any way you can when you're a seller. There's a short list of banks with really bad reputations, then a lot of banks and mortgage brokers with no reputations, which isn't exactly a good thing either. Uh, then there are a few with some very strong reputations. Let's say you're in a multiple offer situation and two offers, well, they're very similar. One offer has a pre-approval with Rocket Mortgage or Bank of America versus another offer with a pre-approval letter from Guaranteed Rate or maybe Leader Bank. All things being equal, the Quicken Loans and B of A, offer, it's going to lose out nearly every time against those more reputable lenders. This is such an easy way to get an advantage that literally it doesn't cost you anything. Then there's getting approved for your mortgage versus a pre-approval or pre-qualification. The difference is that a buyer has fully gone through underwriting. The buyers are fully approved and vetted with the only thing that needs to be done is verification of the asset through an appraisal. With a pre-approval or even worse, pre-qualification, the lender just does a quick verification of income and pulls your credit. You know that 15-minute pre-approval process? Yeah, that's like the worst thing a seller can hear. Great, you spent a whole 15 minutes for a pre-approval and I'm about to take my house off the market and take a huge financial risk when you spent a whole 15 minutes looking at these guys? Yeah, that makes a huge difference. Yes, a full approval, it takes more work. But to a seller, it's worth its weight in gold. Again, a seller takes on a lot of risk when they take their house off the market. So being able to say that you've gone through the underwriting process and only need an appraisal is showing that, well, you're a very serious buyer and a very strong buyer that's going to be less risky than the other buyers they're looking at. And again, it doesn't cost you anything. The third way of increasing your chances of getting an offer accepted in a bidding war is writing a strong initial offer. This is important because it shows the seller that, well, you're serious right from the onset and a lot of sellers aren't even going to come back to buyers and give them that second chance. So what makes an offer more competitive, you ask? Great question. 
There are a number of ways that you can do this. And most likely the winning offer will have well, a mixture of many of these offer variables. I don't know if I like variables. I don't think that's the right word. Sweeteners. Sweeteners sounds more appropriate. Okay. So what type of sweeteners can you offer to a seller? Here are the big ones. Appraisal gap coverage a home inspection threshold or a removal of the home inspection contingency and closing date flexibility. Now, if you're a cash offer or have the ability to write a cash offer, then that is an entirely different discussion, which I'm more than happy to have with you all offline. But let's talk about appraisal gap coverage because I found that this really has been a secret sauce to getting an offer accepted. So what is appraisal gap coverage? Appraisal gap coverage is something that a buyer offers to a seller where they're actually going to look to cover the difference between the appraised value of a property and the agreed upon price. To offer this, you have to have the ability to bring additional cash to the closing or be willing to adjust your down payment percentage. This one, it's a little confusing. And I do have a video that goes into a lot more detail about this. You can see it right here. But like I said, it's the secret sauce. Another area where a buyer can sweeten the deal is through the home inspection contingency. We will never recommend someone to drop their home inspection contingency. There is a lot of risk with that. However, I will say that a lot of buyers will decide to do this knowing those risks, but you don't always need to waive it. That is the one extreme, but there's a middle ground, which is having an inspection threshold. Now, this is where you pick a number with the higher the number, the more aggressive of an offer that it is. So let's say the inspection threshold is, I don't know, $10,000. And that means the buyer will not negotiate any issues under that $10,000 threshold. But a buyer can also do a home inspection contingency where they say it's for informational purposes only. This means that the buyer would have the right to do a home inspection. And should they do a home inspection, then they are not able to come back and negotiate any issues. Basically, if they felt uncomfortable, then they'd walk away, but would probably be losing that initial deposit. I mentioned closing date flexibility, and that is actually the fourth biggest differentiating thing that someone can do in order to make their offer more competitive. Now this one, it always amazes me because a lot of times it will cost the buyer nothing or very little to be flexible. It should be the first question that a buyer's agent asks a seller's agent. Hey, what's the seller's preferred closing date? And is there anything else that's important to that seller? It's a competitive situation. Give the people what they want. Now, many times it might be a situation where it is closing on a property and then providing a rent back to the sellers for time that they're in the property after it closes. The point is, if you love the house and really want the house, then be prepared to be a little flexible and rolling out the red carpet for those sellers. And the last thing, number five, that you can do to make a huge difference and actually doesn't cost you anything more is working with an experienced agent. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, that's easy to say when you are an experienced agent. Of course, you'd say that. Okay, fair enough. But let me tell you about one of my most recent properties that I put under agreement. I have some clients who are currently under agreement. And real quick, don't worry about the price ranges. Is the prices, well, they don't matter. It's truly the process. So take that with a grain of salt. But the house, it was listed for 1.1 million, which was the max that they felt comfortable with originally. For this house, they made an offer for $10,000 over the asking price, so $1,110,000. Now, they made their offer very competitive in other ways. They had appraisal gap coverage and a $15,000 home inspection threshold. Plus, we were the only ones, which is just crazy, the only ones to ask what the seller's preferred closing date was. In our case, it was beyond 60 days. My clients, they felt uncomfortable with the interest rate exposure as you can't lock a mortgage rate beyond those 60 days. So we did a closing 60 days out with a right back to the seller for $1 for three weeks after closing. And another thing, they went back to the open house twice, which the seller really liked as it showed they were very interested and vested in her home. Now, all of that makes a difference, but in my emails to the agent, when I'm sending over the offer, I make sure to hit the highlights of the offer. Think price and the attractive terms like that appraisal gap coverage. But I also talk about how I'm not a newbie agent, have sold more than a thousand houses. So there's not going to be any hand holding or newbie mistakes. And now I also have a transaction coordinator who's going to help ensure the paperwork is handled properly for a smooth and more enjoyable transaction. Every agent wants a smooth transaction and experienced agents get driven up the wall with newbie questions, delays, and their ability of not knowing and understanding how to handle situations. Newbies, they cost deals. Back to this transaction, because of our favorable terms, we got a call back. 
with the agent giving us some guidance. She had another offer for what I believe was around $1,140,000. She asked if my guys could go up higher in the $1,130,000 or $1,140,000 range, and I said they were at their max, but I'm going to find out. I went back to my clients and explained to them the situation. They crunched their numbers and came up for $1,130,000. So they came up an additional twenty grand. we are in the game. And then I got another call. The seller is considering our offer and the other higher offer, and she really wants to go with our offer. But the other offer does not have a home inspection contingency, and ours had the home inspection contingency with that $15,000 threshold. Rightfully so, I knew my guys were not going to drop that home inspection. Before I called my clients back, first, I reached out to my home inspector to find out his availability, and he had availability the very next day at 10 a.m. So I called my clients and told them what the sellers were asking of them. They immediately said no, which I was prepared for. I told them that the inspector I recommended was available tomorrow at 10 a.m. and asked if they could make this, to which point I explained to them my idea of how I might be able to get this done. Mind you, this was all around 7 p.m. I went back to the seller's side and told them that they wouldn't be willing to drop that home inspection contingency, but they can have a home inspection done at 10 a.m. tomorrow with a decision of moving forward by 11 a.m. And I'll be. 15 minutes later, I received a seller's signed offer back. They accepted our offer with the home inspection contingency and it was for less money than that other offer. That's what experience gets you. The agent you hire, it matters a lot. Whether you're looking to buy or sell a home in the next nine or 90 days, then I'm your guy. I'd love to chat with you. All of my contact information, it's in the description below, or you can reach out to me at youtuberealestateagent.com. Again, my name is Jeff Chubb, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time.